In my last video, I bust the myth that the 3.4% case fatality rate announced on March 3rd was false. And I showed that posters who insisted the number was wrong were confusing it with the infection fatality rate. At the end of the video, I predicted this. My bet is that the next response will be, well, it doesn't matter anyway. And guess what? A batch of posts that said, well, it doesn't matter anyway. Instead, they tried a new argument, that the deaths due to COVID-19 aren't really deaths due to COVID-19. So in this constant game of whack-a-mole, I'm going to whack that one down too. By the way, at the end of the video, I'd like subscribers to give me some advice and opinions about a possible change to the channel. Nothing drastic. But back to the new argument. A lot of people said it doesn't matter anyway because, according to the CDC, apparently, only 6% of COVID deaths are actually due to COVID-19. It wasn't hard to track this myth down because the president himself has been spreading it. This week, the CDC quietly updated the COVID number to admit that only 6% of all the 153,504 deaths recorded actually died from COVID. But as you can probably guess, Twitter isn't the most reliable platform for relaying scientific information. So did the CDC really say this? Well, not quite. What it actually said was, for 6% of the deaths, COVID-19 was the only cause mentioned. Doesn't that mean the same thing? No. What the figure means, and you don't need to guess because the CDC explains exactly what it means, is that 6% of COVID deaths showed no comorbidities. In other words, no other health conditions at the time of death. And that low percentage is quite normal, because viruses nearly always cause other health conditions. Measles, for example, causes pneumonia, dehydration and encephalitis. HIV causes pneumonia and cardiovascular disease. The Ebola virus causes hemorrhaging and malaria. And as we know, COVID-19 causes pneumonia and cardiac arrhythmia. On top of that, a third of Americans have some kind of pre-existing health condition, so it's pretty obvious that having comorbidities for any virus is the rule, not the exception. The original source of this claim seems to have been a website called The Virus Truth, which, as you can guess from the title, is a blog specifically designed to spread disinformation about the virus. There's even a page on the link between 5G and coronavirus, and a page which shows how COVID-19 is being deliberately sprayed onto door handles at Trump-owned buildings. And just to show what a weird place the internet has become, some of you probably do believe that coronavirus is being deliberately sprayed onto door handles at Trump-owned buildings, even though that's not on the website and I just made it up. Since that first blog of... No, I made up the claim about coronavirus being sprayed onto door handles. You can stop believing it now. It's not a thing, not even in conspiracy sites. Oh, too late, it's probably already trending. Anyway, since that blog first appeared, the 6% claim has been copied and pasted verbatim all over the internet, from Twitter to Facebook to Reddit. Just to be clear, the CDC didn't quietly update the COVID number. That suggests the CDC didn't want anyone to know about it. It posts an update at the same time every week, and this one was no different. Millions of people read these posts, they're publicly available and hardly secret. And it didn't admit anything, it simply reported the facts. Admit is one of those wonderful editorial words that makes it look as though someone's been hiding something or that a previous claim has been reversed. In this case, it was neither. The CDC was simply stating facts about comorbidities and anyone could access their website to see the facts. And at the time of writing, the CDC is still stating the same facts in its weekly updates and that particular figure is still 6%. Before I move on, it is a tad unorthodox for the president of a country to get important medical information from a tweet, given that he has a team of experts, including the head of the CDC itself, on call day or night to explain the facts. But formulating US policy on the basis of something someone copied from a blog to a tweet has become so normal now, I'm sure a lot of people would think it churlish and un-American for me to even mention it. Sorry. Let's face the fact that that's now perfectly normal in the United States and get back to the fact-checking. Critics who are determined not to blame COVID-19 for these deaths 
don't ask me why, also tried another tack. Just because people died with COVID-19, they say, that doesn't mean they died of or from COVID-19. Maybe it was the pre-existing condition that killed them. After all, people die of diabetes and heart failure every day. Or maybe they've been shot or killed in a car crash and just happened to have COVID at the same time, so COVID gets the blame. This is true to a certain extent. A small percentage of those cases might have died anyway. But in the case of shootings and car crashes, that number is known because they show up as a comorbidity under this listing. Intentional and unintentional injury, poisoning and other adverse events. They number just 6,800 out of 201,000 deaths at the time of writing, just over 3%. And it's also pretty easy to quantify how many people would have died regardless of the pandemic, because all you have to do is look at the average number of deaths over the previous five years. For example, in New York City, the death rate remains pretty constant. It rose in September 2001, for obvious reasons, and it rises slightly during each winter flu season. But in the absence of a pandemic or a terrorist attack, it's pretty constant. So it's not hard to predict how many people would die in an ordinary year. But for some reason, when New York was hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of deaths suddenly shot up. Coincidence? Hmm. So the critics have come up with another argument. Maybe these extra deaths were connected to the pandemic in a different way. Maybe they're caused by suicide. You know, people were depressed because of lockdown. Well, firstly, no, because again, that would show up in the figures. People usually commit suicide by shooting themselves in the head or hanging themselves or jumping off bridges. So while that might explain some of the deaths attributed to COVID in the 3 to 4% of intentional injury category, that still leaves around 97% of COVID deaths that aren't due to suicide. People don't normally commit suicide through obesity, and if they did, it would take time. Secondly, there's not always a correlation between excess deaths and lockdowns. Sweden, for example, didn't lock down, while Norway, Finland and Denmark did. But Sweden had far more extra deaths during the pandemic than its Scandinavian neighbours. So here's another one. One poster suggested that all these people died of old age. Her logic was that there were 13 million more old people in 2019 compared to 2010. More old people, more deaths. Look, it's always worth considering other options. But the number of elderly people goes up by several million every year. I wonder why they would suddenly all die at a time when there's a deadly pandemic. Again, coincidence? It's like saying that 200 people didn't die in a plane crash, they just happened to die of old age at the time the plane was crashing. There comes a point at which you have to say, look guys, give it up, it's a pandemic. The more outlandish the excuses you dream up to avoid that fact, the sillier they look. By the way, I also got a lot of posts from people who argued that mistakenly saying the 3.4% figure was false doesn't matter because the CFR was irrelevant and the more important figure was the IFR. That's certainly true now, as far as the public is concerned, but of course that 3.4% figure was released on March 3rd, at a time when an accurate IFR wasn't known. As was explained at the time, the CFR was just a crude number as a way of estimating how dangerous this new virus might be. Since then, we've had more infection fatality rate figures and they've become more accurate. So over the last eight months, it's the IFR that's been more widely used in the media, not the CFR. However, the CFR is still an important measure for epidemiologists, health officials and hospital doctors. It helps them estimate how many patients who get admitted to hospital might die, and it lets them know how effectively these patients are being treated. Now on to the question I have about the future of this channel. A lot of people say they're not getting notifications of new videos, and I'm told by others that YouTube algorithms are favouring monetized videos that bring in revenue for YouTube. And of course my channel isn't monetized. I don't make a penny out of this. I love the way that baffles critics who are determined to show that I must somehow be profiting from these videos. I don't know why they think that matters anyway. But the other reason I do it is because I don't like to impose those annoying ads at the beginning of each video. 
that now has to be outweighed by the fact that I'm getting sidelined by YouTube because of my failure to monetize the channel. So what I'd like to know is, will monetizing the channel help promote my videos? Would advertisements put people off? What are the pros and cons? And what's involved in monetization if you've done that on your channel? Also, how feasible is it to pay the income I'd get directly to a third party? Because I'd like to give the proceeds directly to Health in Harmony, the charity I support. Any thoughts? And of course, I look forward to your comments on the video itself.